morning. It's good to see each one of you here, and it's good to be here at Buffalo. Every time I think of this church, I have fond and grateful thoughts, because you all have been a blessing to my father-in-law and mother-in-law, and they speak so highly of you as a congregation. So it's a joy to be here with you and share with you and encourage you in relational health and conflict resolution to keep on the good work that you're doing. It is good to be here this week and anticipate being together with family. All of my siblings are coming in this week to be at mom and dad's for Thanksgiving. And it's always just, it always blesses me to be able to come and visit. You guys are a sweet fellowship of believers. And so it's good to be with you this morning. How would you define a conflict? I'll just throw out a very quick definition for you. A conflict is a collision of expectations. It's when what you thought was going to happen, somebody else think something else is going to happen, and they can't both happen. Have you ever had this happen in your life? Whether it's in your marriage, with your family, in your church, in your workplace, all of us are going to face conflicts. But our question for you this morning is, what would you use to describe the experience of a conflict? So if you can think of big conflicts or little conflicts, all different kinds of conflicts, what are two words that you would use to describe conflict. So just take a moment real quick and think, what are two words that I think of when I think of conflict? When you have those two words, please stand to your feet so we can see how awake we are this morning. So you've got two words to describe conflict, stand to your feet. And when everybody's standing, we'll give you your next direction. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate you sharing that. But we won't actually all have to share. So the rest of you have your head. So we're just saying, get them in your head and then stand to your feet whenever you have two in your head. You don't all have to share it. But I appreciate you sharing that. There you so. go. All right, there we go. <laughs> Double money, yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, when you have that, the next step you're going to take is this whole, car- this whole sanctuary just became a spectrum. On this end of the spectrum, conflict is the spice of life. It is a good thing whenever these things happen. Maybe we should go this way instead of the blue line. You don't think we'll all fit in the center aisle? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we, <laughs> let's, let's go this way. Yeah, what I value is some movement for them. Yeah, they can move in their own little way. In their, and how will they get past each other? With conflicts. With conflicts. <laughs> okay, I like this. All right, so... Then we're going to say this side of the sanctuary, conflict is good. It's the spice of life. This side of the sanctuary, conflict is bad, and I feel sick to my stomach when I think of that word or those experiences. Does that make sense? So you can arrange yourself in your row or if you need to move to the next row. But if you think conflict is good, it's the spice of life, that's your side of the sanctuary. And if you think it's bad and it makes you sick to your stomach and you barely showed up this morning because this is a painful topic, then this is your side. And then you can arrange yourself anywhere in between. Ready? Go. Find your spot. Find your spot. If able. could say that. My first observation is that side of the room always tends to be a little more rowdy. (laughs) They might even, they might, (laughs) they might even tell you where some of you should go in this room. (laughs) The, this is a great snapshot. So take a look around. You see how we're spread out across the sanctuary? Not everybody experiences conflict the same way. Very different experiences. 
but we all have something to learn from each other and how we experience it. You know, in the scriptures, we're told that in the body of Christ, if one member suffers, every member suffers, right? So you want to understand each other in the body of Christ and understand our different experiences in conflict so we know when we're talking to each other how we can do that in love. So for that exercise, we'd like to start on this side and love to hear a word or two if there would be some volunteers now to share your two words to describe conflict. What did you pick? Any volunteers on this side? Pain? Scary? Hurt? Fighting? Messy? Disagreement? Did you notice any change from that, the far left to the center, Al, in the description word? Did you hear a subtle difference there? What was the subtle difference? A little more neutral, right? Now, what about this side? Some of you threw out some words that you would use to describe. Problem solving, challenge, what did you say? Good discussion, <laughs> growth, relation, solutions. Do you hear any other shifts in the description from the center to, the, to that side? What are your observations? They want to ride the horse? <laughs> yeah. For some of us, conflict is a horse that we can ride with confidence. For others, it's a horse that's going to trample us. And emotionally, it's very difficult. And a lot of this has to do with their experiences, what you've seen modeled relationally, what you've been impacted by in your past. And what we want to do this morning is just take some time to think through what Jesus invites us into. Because the way Jesus invites us as believers to respond is different. But what I would hope this side of the room will do is file away what you heard on this side of the room and learn from that. Learn how difficult it is. And this side of the room, I hope you can file away what you heard there and, and learn from them as, as part of the body. What, what might be possible? Is it possible for something to be different? Thank you all. Excellent work. You can get back to your seat. And you may have been the most evenly distributed group of people I have seen yet in this exercise. It's probably one of the reasons Buffalo is a healthy congregation. So why become a peacemaker? Jesus invites us and calls us to become a peacemaker. And we read this throughout scripture. But recently there was a study done that actually, in my view, proves that what Jesus taught all along was the right way to approach life. A recent survey, millennials were asked, what two things will make you happy in life? Guess what millennials chose is the top two things to pursue to become happy and fulfilled in life. Any ideas? Somebody say something? Did I hear somebody say money? Money? Yes, money was one of them. Wealth, like a lot of money, not just enough to survive, but wealth. And what else would you might guess? Actually, no. They should have said relationships. You got the right answer already. But they actually said fame, becoming famous. So think Instagram followers, because that's what they're seeing, right? These people that are out there in front of them, they're famous and they have a lot of money and they want to become like that. That's their goal. But a recent study that followed people for a good amount of time actually proves that otherwise. So Liz is going to break down that study for us. So Harvard did a study. They took... 724 men, and they studied them for over 75 years. So these were men who were from poor families, from wealthy families. Over the time of this study, some of them, I think one of them became a president. Um, some of them moved economically. But what they wanted to find out was they wanted to find out what makes people happy and healthy. And at the end of that study, the fourth director of the study concluded we could have the next slide, exactly what Elvin said. He looked at all the data that they compiled, and they said the single greatest factor indicative of a good life is the quality of one's close relationships. The study also said that conflict, it turns out, is actually bad for our health, so that the pro protracted, long, negative, painful attacking in a marriage relationship, for example, actually shows up physically in people's lives as they go on with more health problems. There is a 
pain that is emotional, that is spiritual, that actually expresses itself physically if people don't learn how to resolve conflict. So when we say, why become a peacemaker? We say, because it's going to happen. You will have conflicts. We'll all face them. But we're going to look as followers of Jesus. How can we work towards resolution? It's no wonder that Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, what did he say? Blessed are the what? Peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. In Genesis, we see that when God created the world, there was perfect harmony. There was peace. There was peace between people. There was peace between humans and creation. And there was the perfect peace between God and people. Can you imagine what Adam and Eve's conversations were like before the fall? You just imagine that. What words would you use to describe that kind of a conversation? This is your chance to speak out loud right away. <laughs> hey, you had good stuff to say before, so I was going to give you a first shot. Harmony. Edifying. Relationship with God. Good. What other words would you use to describe a pre-fall relationship dynamic between Adam and Eve? No strain, no pain. Perfect. Yeah. Healthy. Thank you. Good. A few more words. Bliss. I like that word. Synergy. Loving. Joy. So this is the, what God said when he said this is very good. He's looking at what you're describing. This is his creation and his intent for humankind, for all of us. But as you know, that fall happens in the garden, and Satan comes in and deceives Adam and Eve, and they disobey God. And when that happens, this relationship between God and humanity is broken. And then the relationship between Adam and Eve quickly sours. What does Adam say whenever God shows up and asks him why he's hiding? What's that? He blamed Eve. And ever since then, spouses blame each other for the problems, right? And he blamed God. Something was so broken in Adam that instead of confessing his sin, all he could do now was he was blinded to his own responsibility and he pointed at others and passed on the blame. So that perfection we saw, that harmony is, is broken. And what happens to two of their children, Cain and Abel? It gets pushed to the limit and Cain, out of jealousy that's uncontrolled in his heart, kills his brother. Can you imagine the grief that that caused Adam and Eve as parents to watch their family implode like that, watch their son take another son's life. That's where sin and the fall and Satan and disobedience leads us. And that's the world that we find ourselves today. But what did God say in Genesis chapter 3? In the middle of laying out the consequences for the sin, God gives hope for all the people and when in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, he gives a promise of one who will come to make the world right. There's redemption for what is broken, that there will be peace. And we see that all through scripture too, when in Isaiah and passages that talk about one day on God's holy mountain, all will be made right. So there's the promise that what is broken will be made right. And that is what we get to hold on to. And what a day that'll be when our Jesus we see. Amen. When we see him restore things to where they were in the garden, we won't have to imagine what it was like. We'll, we'll get to experience that relationship with God and that relationship with each other. It's perfection. So that's the hope that we have. And that's also understanding that where we're at when we look at Jesus saying, blessed are the peacemakers, we get to stand in this moment in a restored relationship with God through Jesus Christ's work on the cross, because without Jesus, there is no peace. But through Jesus, we have that peace, and now we get to share that peace with others. So what does peace mean? The Greek word for peace 
means living in the condition of God's peace. It also means bring to peace, to be at peace. So it's more than the absence of attention or conflict. It's actually the presence of God's peace in our lives as believers. And that happens through the Holy Spirit in our lives. As Galatians says, the fruit of the Spirit is peace. So, if we walked in that perfectly as believers, what would our marriages look like? What would our churches look like? What would our workplace look like? But it seems that our perfection is still in process, isn't it? I know mine is. When I get tired or hungry or grouchy, I can know all the stuff about conflict resolution. I can still snap and raise my voice at my wife or my children. And it's in those moments I'm reminded, Jesus, I need you to work on me. I need you to help me live this out. I need you to help me be a peacemaker. I need to walk in your peace. One young man I was counseling with who, in his marriage, we have this scaling question we ask in follow-up from Prepare and Rich in the first year of marriage, like, how satisfied are you in your marriage on a scale of 1 to 10? And whenever he answered at a 6, I think to myself, that's not something you want to aim for, because I think Eden is a 10, right? We're probably not going to ever have perfection in our marriages, but we want to grow. So if we're at a 6, what's going on? And as I started asking more questions, I came back to, how's your relationship with God? How connected are you feeling to God? Guess what number he gave me for that? Can anyone guess? A six. Ah, you see, our relationships this way can't be restored and have peace any more than we are connected to our Heavenly Father through Jesus' work and filled with his spirit. Because when that happens, then we're not relying on someone else to meet our needs. We have our needs met in Christ, and we can then be peacemakers for others. So as we look at conflict, there's many different ways that we can approach conflict and ways to resolve conflict. And this morning, we just want to look at five different ways. And if we can get the the next slide up there. There are some conflicts where you, where it's very goal-oriented. You need to have an approach that's going to come in and say, what are the problems and try to find the answers. And up on the top left side, it would be maybe identified as like a shark approach of we're going to solve the problem and be very goal-oriented in how we solve the problem. And there are times when relationships needed. You can see that there is a a continuum here. The more goal-oriented you are as a personality, the more you'll be oriented towards that corner. The more relationally oriented you are, the more you'll be oriented to the far right corner, which is called the teddy bear. I happen to be oriented towards the teddy bear side of the equation and relationships, and my wife, Liz, happens to be oriented to the goal goal side of the equation, which gives us a lot of healthy discussions in our marriage. Or sparks, (laughs) depending on how you want to look at it. Because we see things so differently. It could be a gift. In the Bible, we see the Apostle Paul. Where would you put him on this continuum, just to get your imaginations going? Would you say Paul leaned towards the goal or towards relationships? The goal, sharks, I hear it. And what about Barnabas, his, 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 his friend of Barnabas, who brought him in and helped him get credibility in the church and went on a mission trip with him? Where would you say Barnabas leaned? Relationship, teddy bear. And you remember what caused their sharp disagreement when they actually parted ways? What was the thing that the conflict hinged on? Whether John Mark would come along on the trip or not. Paul said, we need to focus on the mission. And last time, John Mark bailed, so let's leave him behind this time. And Barnabas said, let's give him another chance. Let's take him along. And they had such a sharp disagreement that they actually parted ways. So these are the four ways of approaching. Well, we've covered two of them, the goal-oriented and the relationship-oriented. If you look down in the bottom corner where it's low on goals and low on relationship, there's a turtle there. So if you can kind of maybe imagine an approach of conflict where you're going to tuck back into your shell, sometimes this can be needed when it just simply uh, an offense needs to be overlooked. That would be the healthy approach of a turtle. But sometimes that can be a negative side if there's things that actually need to be addressed 
but if we're just gonna hide in our shells, it's not actually gonna get resolved if a turtle leaves that night. All of these styles have their appropriate uses and all of them have their weaknesses. So the owl is where you are negotiating and getting people to understand each other and keep goals in mind and you're trying your best to find something that works for everyone. So goals and relationships are held in harmony. One example I heard of this missing is an Amish bishop who was in the relational end of the spectrum. And he had a, and his neighbor had a road dispute about who, the use of the lane. And so one neighbor came to him and explained the problem and how his neighbor was in the wrong and that he should have access to this road and he shouldn't use it. And the bishop listened. He's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And then after he left, the other guy came and he explained the problem and why he should be able to use the road and how this person's treating him unfairly. And the bishop listened and he said, relationally, yeah, yeah, you're right. And his wife, who was in the next room and heard him have both those conversations, came in and said, they can't both be right. You can't say they're both right. And he looked at her and said, yeah, yeah, you're right. So that's a teddy bear getting unhealthy, right? But a, a, an owl approach would say, let's have these two people sit down together, hear each other, understand their difference, and find a resolution that they can agree upon. So that's where we want to spend the rest of our time. This feels a little bit like a whirlwind this morning. We usually teach this over a much longer time. So any questions so far? Yeah, so that relational style looks like a person who is motivated to keep relationships even at the expense of their goals. So they might have something they'd like to see, but they'll, they'll gladly set it aside to accommodate others. And maybe over time they'll set aside so many of their goals that it's not with gladness anymore. It's actually with a little bit of burden or resentment almost, like I wish somebody knew what I wanted and needed, but nobody does. I'm the victim. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question and point. Because you might use a different style for different situations. At work, you might need to be very oriented. At home, you might need to soften up and, and use much more of a relational approach. Because you can fire an employee, right? You're not going to fire your spouse. You've made a covenant commitment to be in relationship the rest of your life. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And that could vary. I could totally see how it would vary where you land on the spectrum based on that. What did you decide on, work or home? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, you need competition in sports is what he's saying, if you can, didn't catch that. Like, conflict in sports makes things interesting. But you don't want the same thing in your marriage. Excellent point. Great. Well, what I hope you hear from us real clear this morning is that we're talking about this from a perspective of our relationship in Christ, what Christ has given us, then learning how to spread that in our homes and our workplaces. And these styles can just be helpful points of self-awareness. They're, they're nowhere in the Bible, but I think if you look through the Bible, you can see them. And the next thing we're going to do is just explain a little bit how we as a shark and a teddy bear have navigated some of our disagreements and put up on the screen a way that you can think about walking through disagreements if you have someone who's at a different place and experiencing conflict with you. A process that makes everyone feel safe, gives everyone a chance to speak, and understand each other, and find a solution. So if you want to be employing the owl style, the wise owl who listens, holds relationships and goals in mind, this is, these are the steps that you can take. So anytime that you're going to resolve conflict, you're, there's going to have to be communication. 
So if you look at this green and blue arrow, the green arrow's going up. And that kind of represents communication starting to happen. In order to resolve a conflict, both sides need to be communicating. Um, all the thoughts and feelings that are inside need to come out, and that comes out with communication. So the higher up on that arch you get, that means the more communication is happening with the other party. And if you're on that side of the room with your experience of conflict, this can be a helpful reframe. Like when you find out that there's different expectations and it feels like tension, the positive thing is that green line, you now know more than you knew before. You didn't know that before, you have new information. But on the blue line you see going to the right is intensity. And all the information in the world isn't much good when you end up yelling at each other or when you end up calling names. Or for myself, if I end up saying, you always or you never, have you ever heard those words come out of your mouth? Those words of criticism? When I hear those words coming out of my mouth, one, I know that's not true somewhere inside of me, but in the moment things have become so intense, I am exaggerating to try to make my point. So we'd like you to think for one moment about what are signs for you that you you see that the sweet spot we've circled there is where you want to keep your communication because if you can keep your communication calm and deliberate as you're trading new information, then you're more likely to move towards this side of the room in your experience. But if it escalates to people who are being critical or eye-rolling or yelling or shutting down, then the more likely you are to move to that side of the room, the more that's your experience. So the question is, what would be signs for you that you're about to slip over the edge? I know my cues. If I hear myself say to my wife, you never want to follow me in a decision <laughs> because she's very goal-oriented, right? If I hear never, I'm like, oh boy, I need to stop, take a time out, and come back to this conversation later or make an apology because I just got too intense for this to be healthy. And for those of us in the room who tend to just be more goal-oriented in the middle of conflict, it's easy to kind of get on that scale really fast because we have a goal in mind and we can put out what we think and feel should happen. And some things that those of us who are goal-oriented need to do is create space and safety for maybe those who have had painful experiences with conflict or people who really want to hold the relationship. They really value the relationship and so they're going to be slower to put their thoughts and feelings out because they really value how you feel. And if you can remember that and create space for the other person to put their thoughts and feelings out, that will help keep you at that healthy place of communication and intensity. So what's a sign that things are getting too intense for you? Just, yes, sir. Yeah. The question is, where does perceived truth come in, and how does that play out? If you're a truth teller personality and you're telling the truth, people's feelings, if I'm reading between the lines, aren't that important. <laughs> so I guess the question I'd ask back to you is, what does it mean to speak the truth in love? What does it mean in Galatians 6, 1, that whenever someone falls, you go to them in gentleness, hoping to restore them? What does that mean? And I, But just take one minute and share with somebody next to you or a few people next to you, what's a sign for you that you're getting too intense or that a conversation is getting too intense? If you got one, just turn to a few people next to you and share, here's one sign for me. Circle up or turn to you person next to you and just share one thing.
Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. That's some good discussion. It's a great thing if you could become aware of when things are getting too intense. And you know what you want to do if you're in a conversation like that? Not shut down, not lash out, but if you feel it's getting too intense, just say simply, hey, I'd like a timeout. I'd like to take a break. Physically, your brain can actually get flooded with the same chemicals that you would experience if you're in the woods and you see a predator coming at you, like a bear or a dog. If you feel attacked, your brain can get that experience in a conflict when things get too intense and someone you love suddenly feels like a threat to you. But if you give yourself 20 minutes to walk, calm down, soothe yourself, go outside, pray, and come back, that person will cease to look like a bear and you'll probably be able to get somewhere to solve that conflict. So asking for a timeout is a key to calming the intensity. You cannot win when tensions are too high. It's like, I'll just leave it there. So we'd just like to share one story that we um, experienced in our own marriage and parenting specifically. So we have two of our girls in the room today. But a long time ago when they were really little, we, I, would, I am a stay-at-home mom, so I would spend all day with the kids. I would love on the kids. I would snuggle the kids, read stories to the kids. And then when 8 o'clock came, it was that bedtime, right? So we would put the kids to bed, and then we would hear these little footsteps coming back down the stairs, and they would show up again. And so we would. And I would say, put the kids oh, back hey, into bed. It's time to go back to bed. Pick her up and carry her, lay her down. It was so precious because how often are we going to have little feet pattering through our house? And with that affirming behavior of the relationship, they would come back out again. And once again, I would give them a hug and take them back to bed and tuck them in and say they just need a little more love. They must be thinking about something. I want them to feel this safety and love and warmth at bedtime. The goal at 8 o'clock is to get the kids in bed. The real, the real important thing in life is relationships, and we only have kids for a little time, and then they're going to grow up and leave us. And we've been relating with them all day long. <laughs> And it's 8 o'clock, so it's time for them to stay in bed. Can you see any differing expectations here? So as some of those conversations went along, it escalated quickly. We probably had, this is our last big conflict, so we like to try to be real. And, and this was... It lasted for days and days on end because yeah. the pattern kept happening. The little feet kept coming down the stairs. And I would say things like, you always, or you, you, you want to keep the structure so much that you're, like our kids are going to go to bed feeling unloved, and I really don't want that to happen, and I wouldn't always use I words, sometimes I would switch to say you, you want to punish our kids at bedtime, which is, a, which is another yellow flag, when you start to accuse someone instead of speaking for yourself, your thoughts and feelings. And I started attacking him and his style, and I would say, well, if you keep doing this, our kids are going to raise, be brought up to be these little spoiled brats. <laughs> Time out. We need to talk about this later when we're calmer. And we learned that in our studying this, that we just need to take a break, but not let it go. Sometimes you make the mistake of taking a break and never picking it back up. And we've also agreed, like, if we can't solve something in a week, we'll go to our marriage mentor couple and ask them for help because we don't want to leave unresolved tension. Studies show that the average couple waits six years to get help after they need help. Six years. And then there's a lot to try to untangle to save a marriage. So the first thing that we had to do was neutralize the issue. So we, in a moment when we were calm, we had to say, okay, like, what are we actually trying to solve here? And the issue was... It was not that I wanted spoiled brats, and it was not that she wanted to punish our children at bedtime. If you frame an issue like that, you have blame in it, you'll never solve it. So you have to neutralize it. So the issue was, how are we handling bedtime routine with our children? Does that make sense? 
Nobody feels defensive about that. How are we going to handle bedtime? Let's we both on wanted to tackle that one together. And then you listen. So I asked her what she really valued in it. And I said, well, I really value that our kids learn to be obedient and that we have time in the evening after we put the kids to bed that we can spend some time together. Light bulb for me. Do I want to spend some time with her? Absolutely. Did she say anything about wanting to punish our kids? No. Her values are that we have some time together, that the kids are in bed. And I think I also heard the value that our, there's structure and that our kids grow up to learn obedience. Great. Right. And then when I asked him, well, what do you value in this? I explained that my value was simply that they feel nurtured and loved. And their last thought with their head on the pillow is the mom and dad care about them. And I was like, well, hey, I actually share that value. And I was like, I share your values. And then so we had to so go to the next So what are we step. fighting about? <laughs> and That's we had to brainstorm some solutions. And brainstorming, what you can do is just throw out a couple options that represent both people's values. Because what happens when you're fighting, you can't think creatively. Once you've calmed down, you've discovered values, then you can say, hey, how do we want to do this? How can we both have structure and nurture at bedtime? And brainstorming solutions often looks like both of you putting two or three ideas out there and saying, we could do this, this, or this. And the other person says, we can do this, this, or this. And then when you see a bunch of options out there, sometimes there's that owl approach of saying, well, what can we maybe put together that could solve this problem? So after days and probably three or four conversations to get here, we finally came to a, a solution to try, which was simply, let's put the kids to bed. Let's stay in the room and talk with them for about five minutes. Let's get them real snuggled in, tell them a story, ask them about their day. Just let them get really settled in. And then after we leave the room, let's be very structured. No more hugs. No more carrying kids back to bed if they come out. And let's expect them to keep that guideline we've set for them. So the first night, we hung out in the room, had them snuggled in, and we walked out down to our room, and we sat there. Because you always have to experiment to see if, a, if an agreement's going to work. you got to follow back up. You might still have more to work on. And we listened and listened and listened to the pattering of feet. And miraculously, it worked. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> No feet came out, and ever since, that's been our routine, and it we, worked. We, yeah, that is still a routine that we use with the kids today. Um, they're all five years older, but we tuck them into bed, spend time listening to their day, talking, connecting, holding the relational value at that bedtime. And I just, I don't know about you, and, but I think that for myself, I'm grateful that God gave me a spouse who sees things differently. And I think she has sharpened me and helped me to grow as a person. And I think that's how God designed marriage to work and how he designed life in the body of Christ to work. We're not all the same. We're not all going to experience things the same. But together, as we glorify him, we need each other. And the same would go true this way as well. I have learned so much about being aware of how people feel because I'm so goal-oriented that when those of us who are goal-oriented, if we listen and understand how people who are relational oriented in conflict, how, what a great gift that they bring to conflict. Because so often you can navigate through conflict with people feeling heard and respected when you have people on a team that really value the relationship. So I believe this is a, these are steps that you can take in your relationship, whether it's a marriage with your children at church you can calm the intensity, take timeouts, neutralize the issue, don't put blame in it, discover their values, share your values, brainstorm solutions, and try one out, experiment, and see if it works. You just might find that your experience with your next conflict is better than your last. Any questions about this process? We have three minutes, so Q&A. Thank you for saying that. She makes an excellent point. We cannot 
make someone else a willing participant in this. And that can be a very painful thing to live with that and realize that even though I'm willing to do all these things, someone else is not stepping into that. And for whatever reason, they choose a different path. And that can be, that can be difficult. Yeah, this is not an easy fix for everyone. It takes two willing participants. And I, and I think of the verse, I think it's in Romans where it says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And so as we learn our own um, self-awareness and know what, well, what can I do? Um, and then that's all you're responsible for. Like you're not responsible for the other party. That's an excellent point. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Question? Comment? Yes. If you're working with believers, I think the very first question is their relationship with God. Because if you ask a believer, how are you glorifying God in this situation? Oftentimes that changes the paradigm because when we're in a conflict, we're not thinking about how we glorify God often. We're thinking about how we win. So I think first it would be the relationship with God if it's a believer. But then second, it would be trying to understand the issue and the relationship. I don't know if I would say that I would pick or choose between those. I think they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Last slide. If we could have the last slide. How many... How many Issues do you think are unsolvable in a relationship that keep reoccurring? According to research by the Gottman Institute, in a marriage at least, 69%. Uh, why are we even here talking about conflict resolution? <laughs> because the reality is, even though Liz and I solved our specific problem of bedtime routines, our hardwiring stays the same. So it's not just about solving a problem every time. Sometimes it's learning about how you live with differences in ways that glorify God. So if you're wondering how to do that, that's what we're going to cover in the message, and you're actually going to hear Romans. Everything impossible to live at peace with all men. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for your followers here, your children here, sons and daughters of the king. We thank you that your kingdom is a kingdom of peace, shalom, well-being. That the, the way you created the world in Eden is a perfect harmony, is a place you're taking us through the work of Jesus Christ, and that when he comes, we'll see it. And thank you that today we can, by faithful obedience to your word, step more into that each day, in each relationship, in each discussion, in each disagreement. So give us grace to glorify your name and how we handle our differences Give us understanding of your great love, where we doubt our value or even the worth of mentioning our ideas. Give us a great understanding of your mercy to understand others' perspectives that you want to bring along on the journey in the body of Christ. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for being here. Bless our time of fellowship and the service that will follow. In Jesus' name, for your honor and glory. Amen.
working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.
Thank you, Lester. And I've been blessed with a wonderful family for in-laws. There's a lot of in-laws jokes out there, and I just don't relate with them because I love coming to be with my in-laws for holidays, and I respect my father-in-law a great deal, my mother-in-law. I feel blessed to have my brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws that I do, and all the cousins. Family is one of God's big blessings, is it not? That's how he designed us to be in close relationship with each other. And in those relationships, he designed us to live in harmony. But how many marriages do you think today end in divorce on average? Any guesses? 60%? 75%? Let's stop before it gets to 100%. <laughs> I think the last study I read estimates that about half of marriages today will end in divorce. And that stat is skewed a little bit because more and more people aren't even taking the step of a covenant commitment in marriage as God designed. Why is that? Well, oftentimes it's because they hesitate, thinking they've seen marriages not work out, and they don't know if it will work out, and so they want to try to figure out if it will work before they enter that. And so they disregard God's word and try to do it themselves. But that doesn't work, church. For flourishing in relationships in our lives as God designed, we need to look at what the word says about how we live and do life together. We need to make that covenant commitment before God, and then we need to walk it out together and experience peace. If you were here in the Sunday school session, I ended with a discouraging stat that even if you have the skill of talking things through and quickly resolving a conflict, which you can grow into that outer, that outer sea skill, I call it, that competency, just the way you use your words and language, you can understand each other. Even if you can do that, there's probably going to be reoccurring dynamics in a marriage or in a friendship or in yourself or in a church where you will butt heads with people. You will rub each other the wrong way. You can't escape differences and you can't escape conflict. It will find you. I love living at peace. I love nothing more than peace and quiet. But I grew up with six brothers and sisters. Do you think disagreements found me? Do you think conflicts found me? Absolutely. Especially when one brother who was a year younger than me could run faster than me. What's up with that? That conflict created jealousy in my heart and turned me against my brother, and I would say things that were hurtful to him on purpose, trying to bring him down a little, trying to lift myself up a little. And it was years before I realized that the root of our conflict was sinful jealousy in my heart against my brother. But by God's grace, he led me to see it and repent of it and ask my brother for forgiveness and receive it. And now whenever I go to a race that my brother's running in, I feel joy that he's fast. And I celebrate that. And I celebrate that in his life. That's what God wants to do in our lives as believers, is show us where sin is affecting our peace relationally, convict us of our sin, and lead us to confession and repentance. So I hope that you are here this morning wanting to learn from his word about how to be a person of peace. God didn't slow my brother down. He's still faster than I am. That didn't change. But what changed was my heart. One man once said that if you're a parent and you're coaching kids in sports, you should teach your kids this, that what is more important than winning the sporting event is the kind of player you are on the team. Now, why would that be the case? Isn't what it's all about a good competition winning? Well, the person went on to reason, the reason it's more important what kind of person you become is because if you become a good teammate, guess what? You're going to be invited to join other teams. You'll become the kind of person that will be invited to play in other games, not just in the sports world, but in life. The kind of person you're becoming matters more than if you're winning or not. And I think if we look at God's word this morning, we can get five keys, five principles, five practices that if we apply them, no matter what we're going through, will help us become the kind of people who are peacemakers, who carry the presence and peace of God with us. So let's get started this morning by turning to Romans chapter 12, verse 18, and look at the first of five keys to peace. 
Romans 12, 18. Do all you can to live in peace with everyone. What's the context here in the book of Romans? Romans explains the problem of our sin in the first couple chapters, and then it explains Jesus' work to seek and save us in the next couple chapters. And then, in this chapter, you'll find a description of what happens to our hearts when we are changed by the work of Jesus Christ. And this is one of them. We can do all we can to live at peace with everyone. But all you have to do is open social media to see that living at peace with others can be difficult. All you have to do is have a discussion about a tense topic with a family member and realize that peace could be difficult. There is a lot of division in our world today. There is a lot of hatred in our world today. And Romans was written in a context where division and hatred, guess what? We're already there. What was the life of a believer that is receiving this epistle, that is receiving this instruction to live at peace with everyone? They had a government that legally could have them burned at the stake, lit up like a torch, killed for being a Christian. They had people that thought they were atheists because they didn't believe in all the fake Roman gods, and so they persecuted them. They lived with persecution. They lived with the real threat of death when they gathered as believers, like we're doing right now this morning. They didn't gather with confidence that they wouldn't be ratted out and turned in and thrown in prison or questioned. So in that context, God's word says, do all you can to live in peace with everyone. Wow. Suddenly it makes Facebook look pretty easy, doesn't it? Or Instagram or whatever social media platform you're on or talking with that one family member. That God always gives you one family member, right, who sees things very differently somewhere in the extended family gathering. And you think, oh boy, here they come. Well, that person's there for a reason. To give you a chance to practice living at peace with everyone. Do all you can to live at peace with everyone. And if the church in the early days lived this out when they were persecuted, when there was hostility against them, if they bore witness to Jesus even when they were at the stake, burned at the stake, how can we as believers bear witness to Jesus in conversations where people see things differently, where the world tells us that we should hate each other, see each other as enemies? I'd like to tell you that in the church of Jesus Christ, the way of the world never shows up. We just, we're so radically different. But it's not the case. In my first time as an associate pastor in Cincinnati, I saw a conflict that grew between the elders and the other an associate pastor that wasn't talked about, that wasn't resolved. And I saw hurt feelings. I saw anger and frustration. And then a resignation, and the church hurt and confused and floundering. And as I watched all that happen, my heart was deeply saddened and affected because I thought, we're the body of Christ. Can't we treat each other better than this? Can't we as a church do better if Christ's peace is in our heart? Even if there was a parting of ways, couldn't have it be done with a blessing instead of hurtful words and anger and pain and confusion for the body? I believe that the same Holy Spirit that empowered the early church to live that out, to live witnesses of peace that would bless their enemies, that would pray for those who persecuted them, that would overcome evil with good, that power of God is at work in your lives, our lives as a church. So I believe we can aim higher than dealing with conflict like the world does. What are the five keys that we want to find this morning in God's word? The first key comes from Matthew 18, 15, for the body of believers, and that is this, have direct conversations. Have direct conversations. Let me ask you, when someone hurts, if someone in the body of Christ hurts your feelings, does a wrong, what's the easiest thing to do? Is it to go talk to them directly? Or is it to go talk to someone else? I would love an honest answer. What do you think? What's easier? 
talk to someone else, right? I, I, I think you're right on that. I know it's easier for me to do that. It's easier for me to be in a meeting that doesn't go well and come home and talk to my wife about it <laughs> than it is to follow up with the person I was in the meeting with. It's easier because when we have tension, we tend to find ourselves looking for someone to support us and not someone to challenge us. We tend to look for someone to validate us and not to question whether or not there's something we could do to help the situation. But what does Jesus say we should do? How does Jesus say we should approach it if we see someone who has sinned against us or has harmed us or is harming the body? Does he say we should go find support from others about what we're seeing? In Matthew 18, 15, he says this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. I wonder if this is the least practiced teaching of Jesus in the church. I wonder that. I don't know. There's no research on it. Maybe some of the young people will become researchers someday and you can crunch the data. But how often is it that in the body of Christ, the default setting is, I've been offended, I've been hurt, I am following Jesus, so I'm going to go and address this directly in a direct conversation with the person who hurt me. I think sometimes we don't do that because we don't know how to do that. We haven't been taught that. But God's word gives plenty of guidance there, too. Galatians 6.1 says to go gently. Go gently. Go in a spirit of humility. Don't go, like, angrily and yelling at the person. But go gently and express what you see is the wrong and how it's impacting others. And give them a chance to apologize. And maybe as you go, you'll find out that it wasn't as bad as you thought or you misunderstood something. But what happens instead is if you don't go have that hard conversation and find an other person to lean on, an other person to support you, guess what happens? The, what's going on in your heart, the anger, the frustration, what are you doing with it? Instead of resolving it, you're spreading it like manure over a field, and it stinks. And if that person spreads it to someone else and someone else, soon there's a lot of stink in the church. And guess who doesn't know about why the stink is there? Who's the person who's clueless? The first person, the person who did the offense. No idea why people are now walking through church looking at that person sideways or funny. What's going on? Why is there this tension? I feel this tension there. What's it coming from? I have no idea. And so sometimes our well-meaning thought of we don't want to hurt or offend this person actually ends up creating an offense in the body of Christ. And if we're going to remedy that, we have to be willing to do what Proverbs says and say, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Be willing to step in. And even if it hurts, even if it's a difficult conversation, then at last it's cleared up, it's resolved. You've restored the relationship with your brother. So if we were to draw that out, this is what it might look like, a triangle. You have a conflict with the person, so there's tension there on the screen that's represented. And you have this decision to make. Do I go find support for this? Do I spread my anger and frustration about this situation? Or do I go to the person and resolve it? And I want to challenge you this morning. The next time you find yourself venting about someone, pause and say, Lord Jesus, what would you have me do? How can I be a peacemaker? And would you give me the courage to go directly and talk to this person? And if you need guidance in how to do that, if you never saw that modeled, seek out wisdom in how to address it and how to talk about it. But let the Holy Spirit stop you from spreading your frustration and anger across the body, which can cause great harm. Key one, have direct conversations. Key two, ask others to help if needed. What if that conversation doesn't go well? And you might even be imagining somebody you <laughs> need to talk with. Ah, oh, it's not going to go well, Preston. You don't understand. You don't understand who I'm dealing with here. Well, Jesus knows that it's not always going to go well. And he says, if that person doesn't listen, if we continue on Matthew 18, take one or two more with you. 
so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. See, Jesus' model for conflict resolution is start with the person who hurt you, work it out. If that doesn't work, if they're not seeing their sin, and if you're not willing to confess your sin, bring someone else in. Maybe they'll see that both of you have a fault. Both of you have something to confess. Both of you can work at the resolution, and, and you need outside help. And then if that doesn't work, then maybe other people were informed about it, but not until you've tried the first two steps. You want to keep that circle tight. You want to respect each other. You want to work it out. Ken Sandy is a Christian peacemaker. He's a mediator. He was an attorney. He came to know Christ, and so he takes the skills he has in law and his relationship with Jesus, and he helps believers work through differences. And he has this line that he likes to use, which is, if you are working at a resolution to a conflict, and you think 98% of the blame lies with the other person, start by figuring out what 2% lies with you. And start with an apology rather than with fault finding. What does this look like? In one case, Ken was asked to mediate. He got a call from a pastor who said, our leadership team's divided. My elder board is divided because a young lady in our congregation is expecting a baby out of wedlock. And some of the elders in the church feel that she should stand and confess her sin to everyone in the church. And others of the elders feel, react to this strongly and say, we can't single out one sin that we ask people to stand up for. Because we've all sinned. Let's, let's have grace and let's be quiet about this and let's be supportive. And as the elders are having this disagreement, the pastor is torn in two. And so he calls Ken and says, what should I do, Ken? What should I do? And Ken helps him see his 2% of the equation. And he tells him to turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. And the pastor turns there, and this is what he reads. Isaiah 40, 11, verse 11. Ken calls this becoming God-aware, what he's doing right here, helping this pastor get his eyes off of the tension between people and looking up. And this is what the pastor reads. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. And then Ken asks the pastor this question. If the young lady in your church were to read that passage today, would she say, that's my pastor? That's how he has treated me. Tenderly. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. And the pastor saw his 2% of the problem. He had been so busy trying to resolve this tension, trying to figure out what to do, that he had lost sight of a very simple thing. Are we as a church sending a message of love to this young expectant mother? And so he went over to the house of this expectant mother and her parents were in the room and when he sat down, everything was tense because they thought they knew how this conversation was going to go. The parents were defensive. She was defensive. But the pastor led out this way. I am sorry. And he meant it. I have failed as your pastor to represent Jesus to you. And in his humility and his tears, the family's defensiveness went down. And she wept. And the parents apologized. And everybody apologized. And the church came to quickly the thing that seemed unsolvable was solved. Why? Because one person said, Lord Jesus, what would it look like if you were here? What would you do? And followed that. And was willing to be humble enough to offer an apology. So when we have direct conversations, we ask help. If it's needed, 
We look for people who are wise, who have God's perspective to help guide us through. And then we take those steps to be obedient to what Christ says. That's the second key. So key one, direct conversations. Key two, ask others to help if needed. I hope that you have someone in mind. That's my question for you. Who would you ask if you needed help? If you have tension in your marriage, if you have tension with your kids, if you have tension with a brother or sister in the church, and you tried to talk and it didn't work, who would you go to? Do you have a name in mind? If not, ask God about that this week. Think of who would be that person you could turn to. We all need someone like that in our lives, someone like a Ken, to get us looking up, to get us looking at the word, to get us living out what we can so things become more like Jesus intended. Key number three, listen before you speak. We live in a world where speaking is what gets you places. Get a blog, get a following, put your opinion out quickly. Speak, 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 speak. And the louder you can speak, and the more angry and certainty you have when you speak, the more of a following you will get, and the more good you'll feel about yourself. That's the way of the world. But the way of the word is actually completely the opposite. James chapter 119 says what? You must all be quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to get angry. Quick to listen. How many of you woke up this morning and said, today I'm going to be a listener? I'm aspiring to be the best listener that I can be. I want to listen well enough to know my spouse better. I want to listen well enough to know my kids better. I want to listen to my parents well enough to try to understand why they're telling me to do things I don't want to do. I want to listen to my fellow church member. I want to listen. We live in a society that's almost completely devalued listening. But God knows and put it in his word that if we're going to be people of peace, we actually have to be good listeners. Because when you're listening like Ken did to this pastor, you're listening to the effects of sin and shame in a person's life and the confusion that that brings. And then you're listening to God, thinking about what God's word says. And you're wondering, how can I help other people hear what God is saying in this moment, listen before you speak. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Let me tell you this. If you become a really good listener, you'll get a longer fuse with your temper. The, as poor of a listener as you are, that defines how short your fuse will be with your temper. But if you can learn to listen and really understand where people are at and get into their shoes, your fuse will get really long because you understand that almost everyone around you has gone through something. There's a reason they're doing what they're doing and saying what they're saying. They're probably hurting somewhere. They're probably upset about something because of something that happened to them before. I had a, a lady in my congregation, not the current one, a former one, an undisclosed location that was very upset with me, very upset. And she stood up and told the church so while I was gone one Sunday. Much to my gratitude, I now knew that there, we had a problem that I did not know about. But I also knew that it was escalated beyond uh, me just going and talking directly with her. The offense was I had made the decision as pastor to financially help someone more than we had financially helped her. And so when she discovered how much money was given to another family and how little she'd received, she was hurt by that. She was angry. So angry she left her husband and child at church and spun out the driveway after her speech. So what am I going to do in a situation like that? Well, I asked for help from a trained mediator her name was Betsy, and you know what she did? When we sat in her apartment with one person there to prayerfully support me and one person there to prayerfully support this member of my church, Betsy showed me the skill of listening like I had never seen before. This lady would say something in anger, 
And she would listen. And she would say, so you felt this when this happened. You felt like you weren't valued by the church. You felt like you weren't wanted. You felt like, and this lady's anger came down, 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 down. Because you see, communication, when it gets too intense, can become a negative experience. I honestly didn't want to have this conversation with this lady. Just being real, I did not think it was going to go well. And I was done with it. But if you could move the next slide. What I learned in that experience was that when you ask others for help and someone is a skilled listener, what was way intense communication, I don't like being yelled at or, or accused of things. I don't like being told that I don't care about somebody because I do care. But when, that's, when things get too intense, people get to harming each other's feelings on purpose, saying nasty things. Or shutting down and walking away, which is when I get too intense, I don't want to deal with it. So I had to confess my sin before God, which is I don't want to deal with this. This is a member of the body of Christ. This is someone I baptized. The Lord changed my heart. And then I had to get help. And when Betsy came in, what she showed me was that even if things are very intense through listening, intensity can be calmed until people can talk again. And I still remember looking in amazement at one point in this conversation when this lady broke down into tears. You see, she'd had a, a traumatic, abused past in her life. She had been through a lot of trauma, physically abused in many ways. And then she cried. As she cried, she said, I love this church. I love this church. And I love you, Pastor. And I looked at Betsy Patterson, and I, I told her afterwards, I was like, Betsy, that was like magic what you did in there. You know what, church? It wasn't magic. It was Betsy Patterson obeying James. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow anger. And even though the tensions didn't end with this individual, my fuse got a lot longer after I listened. So be quick to listen. Listen before you speak. You don't know what someone else is going through until you know. Key number four, be constant in prayer. Be constant in prayer. And the text for this is Romans, back in Romans, Romans 12, 12. How did the believers maintain peace when they were being persecuted? When you didn't know if when you got home, one of your family members was going to have been arrested. When you went to church, you didn't know if you would be able to worship. Or if that day you would, there would be a raid and someone would be thrown in prison or executed. How do you live in peace in a time like that? Romans 12, 12 says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. What do you think Adam's relationship was like with God before the fall? Genesis describes God as walking with them in the cool of the day. There was this close, intimate relationship where the peace of God that passed all understanding was all that Adam knew. It was a direct connection. And ever since that's been broken by the fall, we have lived like seeing through a glass darkly, as the Apostle Paul said. But when we see Jesus and we find him, we invite him in his heart, the Holy Spirit works to restore this in us, and we can communicate with our Heavenly Father now as children of God because of his work on the cross so that now this peace that passes understanding can guard our hearts once again. And the way we do that, the key to that, is prayer. It's communicating with God. It's starting out your day with God. And it's not stopping there. It's walking through your day with God. It's having in your heart this desire to every moment speak a word of praise to the Father or invite the leading of the Holy Spirit in a conversation. It's a journey of trust in God. And when you trust God, then you have this peace that passes understanding, peace that when you're going through difficulties or even tensions, people see that there's a difference in you. How are you still smiling with all this going on? How are you still at peace? 
One professor by the name of Dallas Willard, he's a brilliant man, a theologian, a scholar, a philosopher, a follower of Jesus. He once, <laughs> he was lecturing in class, and as he finished his point, he invited comments near the end of the class, and a student stood up, a sharp student, and laid into what he had said publicly in front of all those other students, just cutting down all of his teaching, what he just said, arguing with him. When he finished his angry tirade, Dallas Willard looked at him and said, thank you, class dismissed. Afterwards, a student came up to him who was really troubled by this, just felt unsettled. He said, Dallas, why didn't you respond to that? You could have torn that guy to shreds, his arguments to shreds. And Dallas looked at him and said, I'm practicing the discipline of letting someone else have the last word. That doesn't happen without a walk of prayer, without a real trust in God. The ability to let someone else have the last word. But that was Dallas's life because if you read about his inner personal walk with God, his goal was to walk so closely with God, he told his close friends, that one day when I die and enter heaven, it will take me a moment to realize that that's happened. Because I've been so aware of God's presence and purpose each day that when I actually enter his presence in glory, it will take me a moment to realize that I've crossed the line. Dallas has crossed that line. He has finished his race, and he died a very painful death of a year-long painful cancer. But his, those friends who were closest to him said all they ever saw in his life through that time was gratitude, thanking God for being with him. So if you want to be a person who lives in peace, even if the circumstances are against you, and even if people verbally attack you, this is the key, prayer, walking with God seeking to know him, and the fruit of that in your life, the fruit of the Spirit, will be peace. I used to think of prayer as a thing I did in the morning, my devotions with God, and then at mealtime. But Dallas Willard changed the way I think about that. Now I think throughout the day I want to commune with God, be constant in prayer, so that whenever I'm in a room with you all or talking with anyone, I'm aware that God is present with us, and that he has a purpose for you. So I challenge you, carry that with you this week. Wherever you're at, in your home, at work, that every time you're talking with someone, are you aware of those two things? God is present, and God has a purpose for the person you're speaking with. That's what happens when we pray. We can become aware of that. And when that happens, peace is going to settle in deep. Deep enough, you don't have to have the last word. You don't have to win the argument. You can be content to listen, content to pray. And when it's time, you'll speak what God intends you to speak in love. Key number four, be constant in prayer. Key number five, forgive as you have been forgiven. The verse for this key is Ephesians 4.32. Be kind one to another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Do you see how God's word lifts up our perspective again? We're not comparing our forgiveness of each other with how someone else forgave us. We're comparing how God forgave us with how we forgive. That's what we want to do. Pass on what we've experienced in Jesus Christ. Are you grateful this morning that Jesus Christ has forgiven your sins? That as far as the east is from the west, he's taken them away? He doesn't remember him. He doesn't hold on to him. He doesn't think about him. He's come close to you so you can walk with God like Adam walked in the garden. I am. But you know what? It's still easy for me to be angry and to hold on to bitterness. If I forget that, anger and bitterness in a Christian's heart is just a symptom of forgetfulness of what Christ has done. It's just a symptom of forgetfulness. Ken Sandy met with one man who was having a marriage on the brink of divorce. And he said that in the meeting with the couple, it wasn't going well because her heart was rigid and hard. 
she had been unfaithful to him. And his heart was angry and bitter and still in shock. And so he met one-on-one with the man while she was not in the room and talked to him. And he said, look, Ken, I've forgiven my wife, but I could never be close to her again. So what did Ken do? He asked this question. He said, if you would stand before God today, and God would look at you and say, I have forgiven you, but I can never be close to you again, what would you say? And the man's heart softened. And he realized his 2% of the problem was he wasn't even close to forgiving his wife yet. It's not forgiveness to say, I'll forgive you, but I can never be close to you again. And so when his wife came back in the room, instead of being defensive, instead of having tempers flare, the man led in with an apology. And he said, I'm sorry. I haven't forgiven you. I choose to forgive you today. I choose to forgive you, and I choose to say that that means I don't want this unfaithfulness to keep us from becoming close again by God's grace with time. And Ken said that was a turning point for this marriage, moving from a place of being stuck towards healing, towards reconciliation, which is what the gospel of Jesus Christ does every time when we get it in our hearts. We as believers know that we've been forgiven. That's why we forgive. Not because of what someone deserves our forgiveness or earns it, but because God gave it to us when we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. I've been married to my wife for 13 years, and she's had plenty of chances to forgive me. What would happen if she didn't? If she's keeping a list of my offenses, what do you think our marriage would be like? It would be painful. It would be hard. It would be not what God designed. But because of her willingness to forgive and our commitment to forgive each other, the fences that come between us can be laid aside and love can cover over those wrongs. I was talking with a brother at break, and I asked him if he would mind helping to finish out this message. Because I said, look, I can stand up here and say all these things, and they're true from God's word, and I hope you apply them and find them to be true in your life. But this gentleman has lived it. He's lived it out. And so I said, would you mind concluding the message for us this morning? He said he wasn't looking to do that, but he'd be willing to do that. So I would ask you, brother, if you would mind standing up and introduce yourself and just tell us how long you've been married. Let me let me get that on for you. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Thank you for the message that's so down to earth, what we need. As he was uh, talking here and sharing, and I said to him, I said, uh, you know, we're accountable to God, to the Lord, for what he has done for us. Mm-hmm. And for when we under- have that as our guiding, and we recognize that, uh, with being in mature in the Lord, we can understand and be more understanding and forgiving for those who are less aware of what the truth is. So uh, really it amounts to it's, it's a godliness with contentment is great gain. We spent just about 71 years together. 71 and it's, years. And it's uh, better almost than it was when we got it together. So we're rejoicing in the Lord and boasting in his goodness. 71 years is a testimony of forgiving each other and living in peace. Let's give them a round of applause. Is there anything you want to add? Is there anything you would like to add? I just just thank the Lord so much. He's been so good to me. On Friday, I turned 94. And I just can't believe the things I can do in, in my mind. That is the most precious thing I have. And I just 
And I thought I had so anxious to come today. I thought I want to learn some more. Mm. <laughs> and I sure did. She says the truth stands. Amen. <laughs> Happy birthday. Let's give her. <laughs> Isn't it a blessing to have believers who've walked with the Lord to give us a different story than what the world can offer? Listen, there's not going to be a 50% divorce rate when people are walking and these in the word and living with the Lord and living these things out in their lives. It's going to be 71 years of marriage together. Praise Jesus. I invite you to stand with me for a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning thanking you that you are so good. Thanking you that you've given us your word. You've given us the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins, to lead us to the freedom of confession and finding forgiveness from you, from each other. Thank you that in your kingdom, in the covenant marriage, we're both spouses are open to you. Things get better with time. 71 years of time. Thank you for your love displayed in that marriage and in the marriages in this church. Thank you for your love displayed in this church in parents and their children. Thank you for your love displayed in friendships in the body of Christ. Lord, we want to see your name continually glorified here so we pray you'll protect each one, each member of the body of Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. Protect them from the attacks of the enemy who would steal, kill, and destroy. And give them, Lord, bless them right now through your abundant life that comes in Jesus Christ. We give you all the honor and praise in Jesus' name.